All right, guys, welcome back to Southeastern 14, Blake Level with Max Barr once again, and we are talking more SEC basketball in the offseason. If you missed our SEC summer power rankings, which it doesn't sound like a lot of you missed it because uh, we certainly had some reaction to that one. I think Max can tell you that firsthand on the, the Twitter sphere. Now we've got threads, Max, so it's like maybe we're going to have reaction everywhere on these things. But uh, if you did miss that, we did want to kind of mention that up front. We did do our SEC basketball summer power rankings a couple weeks ago so you can find that on the channel search for sec basketball power rankings you'll find it there uh, but now we're moving to our rankings for kind of individual positions heading into next season and just to kind of give you a an overview of where we stand on looking at some of these rosters and specifically the guard group the forward group the center group all of that uh, as we look at uh, the sec heading into the 23 24 season so max we're going to really focus on the point guards today and, um, you know, you and I were talking beforehand. I think what's interesting about this is it, there's a lot of good point guards in this league, but there's also a lot of other guards that maybe we don't necessarily classify as point guards necessarily primarily, but you can throw them into this conversation. So I think that when you look at the depth overall and a couple of these guys are going to transfer in and we're going to talk about freshmen here in a second too. But um, when you combine all that together, the returners, the transfers, the freshmen, um, there's a lot of good potential point guards in this group and some guys who are primarily going to play the point in the SEC. Yeah, it's been a blast the past few weeks after those rankings dropped. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody can agree that SEC has got to be one of the hardest conferences to rank, though. I mean, you can yeah. pretty much see, I would say, nine teams that could all be ranked in the top 25. I mean, one of those, you know, kind of old school Big East, old school ACC conferences where they have like more than half the conference ranked at one time. So even if your team's ranked middle of the pack, it's still probably a top 25 team. Um, but yeah, these these position rankings, I don't know how much of a specific ranking will do and more of just kind of an overview yeah. on the position and how it lays out for the conference because there's a lot of teams that are starting to move into that positionless basketball kind of thing that uh, Chris Beard has kind of really taken under his own. But, I mean, you want to start out with some of the freshmen coming in because it's hard to – it's hard to rank these guys when they, you don't really know how they're going to translate. Some might be stars. Some might really kind of fiddle out into the bottom of the lineup. But obviously you have your Kentucky guards, you know, Wagner and Dillingham that come in. I'm super stoked to watch them today. We're recording this on a Wednesday before they play in Global Jam. So I cannot wait. That game is on in about an hour and a half. Um Really excited to see DJ Wagner. I've heard great things out of him early practice. Um, I think Rob Dillingham's going to have to put on a little bit of size, but he might just be one of those kind of De'Aaron Fox, you know, aggressive, small, skinny guards that Cal just finds a way to bring the best out of. So I'm really excited for the two Kentucky guards. Um, a little bit nervous because they're going to be relying heavy on freshmen, but I love those guys. And then, um, and then Aiden Holloway coming in. I don't know how... You can't be excited about an upgrade from Wendell Green. Um, I love how they have a little bit of mixed variety in the starting lineup. They got the freshmen, then they got some JUCO transfer, Baker Mazzara. They've got Denver Jones transfer, and then the uh, the front court coming back. So I really like that Auburn lineup. You know, a little bit of a mix of everything there. But those three freshman guards, I'm really excited to see. Are there any newcomers that you're particularly excited about, Blake? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the guys. I think, the, you know, the, the Holloway one to me is interesting because I think yeah. there's the shooting. And, yeah. you know, that's what we've always talked about kind of with Auburn the past several years at times. You know, there's obviously been some some inconsistency there when it comes to their ability to, to shoot the ball. And, you know, I think that for me, the biggest thing with that is we were just so used to, you know, you look at the, the best teams Bruce Pearl has had. And it's not always the case. And I think that's what we have to remember is, yeah, the Final Four team shot it really well from three, but – that was kind of just a different type of team, but they still had a lot of success. You know, even a couple of years ago, not being a team that shot the ball really well from outside. So I think adding some of the shooting and specifically with a, you know, a freshman like that, that we know that can shoot the ball. I'm very intrigued to see just kind of how they, they use him and and get those opportunities for open shots. Cause you know, that will be a big part. I think of just in, improving their offense as a whole is being able to make more shots from outside. And so, yeah, I think that's when you talk about the Kentucky group. I mean, it's just, I think at this point, it's 
like you said, I think Kentucky fans would love to hear a, you know, the Aaron Fox comparison by the end of the season, if that's where we're at, because that means you're doing something really, really well. Um, if that's the case in terms of just their point guard play, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think overall we, we kind of look at the guys and, and I guess we can talk about some of the transfers here too, because, yeah. um, you know, you mentioned, I think there are some, we, we've talked about Jalen cook before in terms of, um, you know, what he brings to the table, uh, at LSU. I think he will be someone that, for a team that really struggled to score the ball. Um, I think having the ball in his hands will really help out a lot. I would think um, to, to get them moving in the right direction. And you mentioned Denver Jones too. I think he's someone else that, like you said, point guard, shooting guard, whatever, just a guard. I think in that, right. that group will be able to, to help as well in terms of that, that Auburn offense being a bit better. Um, you know, Noah Thomason, I know someone that you and I have talked about uh, a bit. Uh, we talked about Georgia kind of in there, um revamped i think roster and i think he'll play a big part of that obviously was the the guy that handled the ball a lot at, at niagara so um that's just some of the ones i've got on here again i know we're probably going to leave some guys out uh, but if we're just talking point guard specifically guys who could handle the ball primarily for their team um i think those are probably you know some of the ones in terms of just the newcomers, uh, newcomers. The yeah 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 just to add on to the newcomers a little bit um, Ole Miss has two uh, ball handlers coming in with Jalen Murray from St. Peter's and Austin Nunez from Arizona State. Um, I was actually talking to a member of the Ole Miss staff a few days ago, just trying to get a feel for who's going to be running the show there. And um, it's still in the early early uh, bits of the offseason here, but Jalen Murray is really kind of step, stepped yeah. into that upperclassman guard role. He's coming in as a junior. Um, I've heard he's been really loud in practice. He's been that vocal leadership voice from the ball handler position that you'd kind of want. So I was kind of all off season. I was like playing around with lineups with Ole Miss. I was like, they might just kind of go positionless and play Merle, Brandon Murray and Alan Flanagan and just kind of dribble handoff and take turns with who's handling the ball. But if Jalen Murray or, or Nunez can really, you know, own that point guard role, Chris Beard might have a might have some options offensively as well as defensively. Still got to wait on those waivers. I know everyone's been giving me a hard time. I'm not not guessing anything. Um, I am. I know, I know <laughs> like, the, uh, the NCAA is. We've said that, Max. I mean, it's yeah. like here's the thing. Like until I see the NCAA deny something, I, I am going to assume that they're going to get approved, and, and that's just the nature of what things have become. And I know it's different now. It's a new rule. I understand, but. I just tend to think that they will find a way to, to get approved. And if they don't, then we're having a different conversation. But for now, right. um, I just think it's, you're going off the trend. And again, I know it's a, it's a new rule, two-time transfer. I get it. But I just, uh, right now I'm going to assume the best for every team and we'll, we'll go down the negative route whenever these guys maybe are not eligible to play. But for now, I'm going to assume they're going to play. 100%. Yeah. So Excited for the Ole Miss guys coming in. Um, not good enough for me to put them in, in a top five per se, but um, just a few other guys I wanted to touch on before I really dive into some of the some of the elite point guard options here in the conference. Um, I'm excited for Mississippi State's backcourt. Um, Andrew Taylor coming in from Marshall. I've mentioned him in a few previous videos. I like how he adds some shooting and Shaquille Moore. I mean, he's not a he's not a bad get at any any stretch of the imagination. You know, he's a, he's a solid point guard. Um, Top five in the conference, I don't know, but still, you know, solid by by all means. Um, so I, I like what Mississippi State's doing. And then two guys that I kind of I, – I think I might get a little bit of drag on for not putting them in my top five because I know some fan bases like them. But these two guys I wanted to mention, uh, Nick Honor and Michi Johnson. I wanted to mention those two guys. Um, and that's not because I think they're poor. You know, I just want to put that out there first. They're not poor – poor players at all but Nick Honor you know he just doesn't you know doesn't do enough for me to put him in a top five in the position you know he just kind of game manager you know he'll get you your eight points probably he'll hit two threes or something like that he'll take control of the ball it's not going to turn it over a ton but you know very short a little bit of a liability on defense just you know your solid point guard you know nothing nothing too crazy for me to put him in a top five and then Michi Johnson, um, the only reason I left him out of my my top five is because I actually have an honorable mention here on top of the top five, and that's – I'll jump into it. That's L. Ellis, and I think L. Ellis and Michi Johnson can be compared pretty closely because they had very similar roles last year. 
both the, the primary ball handler on on kind of a poor team, both of them. Um, Louisville was not very good, and neither was South Carolina. So just looking at what they both did in their situations, Ellis averaged five more points a game. He was only four point or four votes off getting all ACC third team. I think if Louisville wins a few more games, he probably gets an all-conference accolade there, Ellis. So that's the only reason why I have Ellis just a notch above Michi Johnson. But I just wanted to mention uh, those guys, Honor and Honor and Johnson, before we dive in. Well, you know, everyone knows my love for. for Here we go. Uh, Here Nick we go. Honor. Everyone, everyone understands. I mean, I, I dreamt when Chris and I did our our all SEC teams. We were drafting. If we had to play our, um, you know, our two teams against each other in an All Star game, I said, I get it. There's probably gonna be a lot of other guys statistically that rank higher than Nick Honor, but I got to put them on my team because I think you need someone like that leading yeah. the way. Um, so it. And as you're going to see, guys, I mean, you guys always laugh at me about my rankings are never like if we say five, I've, I find a way to get like eight guys on there. Um, but Max is much better at, at being able to filter out his rankings here. But I feel like I have to put Nick Honor on there somewhere. But then as I look down my list, Max, I'm like, I don't know who I, you know, can I put him in front of this guy? Can I put him in front of this guy? Maybe it's just the bias coming out. But um, I think just from a true point guard standpoint, to me, he probably finds a way on there somewhere. Um, just because I think we saw what he did I last year, but but again, that's we we have fun with that here on the channel with my love for for Nick Honor and um and what he did last season for that Missouri team. But um yeah, so I mean I think we, like I said Michi Johnson and Shaquille Moore, those kind of guys, good players. I think it's just it's what's in front of them. It's not right. really about them. It's it's really right. about what's in front of them, and um that's kind of what it always comes down to um with that. So I'm looking down if there's anybody else we kind of haven't mentioned before we jump into sort of your list here, but Walter Clayton was one. Cause I know he played a little bit of point guard at oh, you best um, believe he's on my list. Yeah. Okay. I was going to make sure that, that he's <laughs> on your list somewhere. I I've had a feeling he was, but I'm just looking down mine. I'm like, okay, I'm going to make sure he, yep. he mentions that. And it was Zion Pullen was someone else too. He played point guard. At Ooh, UC good, Riverside, good. But, um, I, I think, there. but I think that that here's what, let's just go ahead and say this. Like when it comes to some of these teams, it's like when you have this combination of a couple guys, I feel like it's like, okay, we're trying to make a top list and all that. But if you really think about it, you talked about like the Ellis one, right? Um, you, you and I were talking before we started recording. It's like, okay, well, Ellis is a really good player. You know, so is Diva Davis. And Davis is probably going to be on both of our lists. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But it's like, at the same time, you know, I'm going to say they're interchangeable, but these are guys that are going to be the primary ball handlers for a certain team. And so, um, I think when you look at it, that combination of a, a Clayton and a pull and two is interesting. Although, like you said, it's, it's understandable to have Clayton probably higher on the list, but uh, all right, Max, here we go. Your top five. Let's, let's hear it. Let's start from the bottom um, and count down because, and I'll just kind of tell you how my list compares uh, to yours, because again, you are much better at this in terms of <laughs> ranking one through five than I am of finding a way to get eight guys on my list somehow. So. All right, yeah. So, like I mentioned, L. Ellis is right on my outside of my top five. Just a little bit of inconsistency issues and some. He was just super high volume on a bad team. Not sure how he's going to translate. For the, kind of those reasons, I left him out. You already mentioned my number five, um, and that's Jalen Cook. Um, I think he's the best newcomer uh, at like the ball handler position as far as transfers are concerned. Um, I know. Um, Estrada for Alabama is probably going to have a little bit of ball handling along with Sears, but it's just hard to kind of pin a point guard down on that team. Yeah. Um, Wright sells also in the mix there. Um, but Jalen Cook, he's pretty much got the keys here for LSU. Um, and he played at Tulane, which is in the American. You got games against Cincy. You got games against Memphis, Houston. You got good competition, quality competition there. So it's not hard to see his numbers translating. Um the only thing I am worried about, I mean, you, there's no denying his scoring. You know, 20 plus games and 16 out of his 26 games played, he's gonna, he's pretty much gonna get 15 plus every time he steps on the court. A little bit of a turnover kind of issue. The average is 3.2 turnovers a game. Would like to see that come down a little bit. Um, but the only thing that I'm worried about with with Jalen Cook is a little bit of inconsistency, and that's you know that you'll find that's a theme with a lot of. Uh, mid-major transfers just because they were so high volume in their previous system that it's hard to perform yeah you know night in night out but um I was looking through his looking through his game log watching a little bit of Jalen Cook from last year and one thing that just stood out to me is he had this two game stretch so he has his worst game of the season at Memphis still had 25 points 
but only had two assists and 11 turnovers. It's, it's hard to win when, you're, when your point guards turn it over 11 times a game. Then the very next game against Cincinnati, still another solid team, 27 points, 14 assists, and only two turnovers. His best game of the year. So he had his worst game of the year and then his best game of the year in back-to-back games. So what 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 Jalen Cook are we going to see? I hope it's the Cincy Jalen Cook, but um, I think he is probably the most trustworthy transfer just because he's from that conference. He, the numbers are so frequent. What, what's your take on – I know you've already kind of touched on Jalen Cook a little bit, but – Well, I mean, I, I think it's, to me, like – and I know I'm probably a little bit higher on LSU than you are when we talked about our rankings, but I think it's it's also what's around him. And I, and I don't, yep. you know, I think LSU, like I said, I think LSU is going to be better offensively because in all honesty, I mean, they have to be. Um, but I, I still, I don't know what to expect from that team in terms of the offensive output. And, and that's where, again, I think you're relying on a Jordan Wright to bring that. Um, you know, you're relying on some of the other guys we've talked about, maybe potential breakout from, from Damian Collins and their reliable post type score. Um, you know, the other guys we mentioned that they're bringing in, uh, Carlos Stewart and, and guys like that. But I think there's still questions about what the overall alf- offensive output is going to be. So I think with Jalen Cook, to me, it's a it's a usage thing because yes. um, there's going to be a lot on him, I think, right off the bat. And I think the other teams are going to know that. I think he's going to easily be one of their best scores. Um, and so I, I'm just curious to see, like you said, from an efficiency standpoint, how does that come into play with the turnovers and those kind of things? Because I think he's going to have a lot put on him right away on a team that is desperate to improve their offensive numbers from a season ago, because that's what really you know put them in the position that they were in to be the worst team in the SEC. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm really high on him too. Um, and I mean, I don't, I, I didn't. I'll be honest, I didn't have him in my top five, but like he's right there in that group. Um, a lot of guys that because, are right there. Yeah, and that's the thing is like you can interchange probably for me several of these five, four, I don't know, maybe three, but I, I have a pretty, I think I have a pretty clear top three. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that's again, I could easily see him being one of the top five point guards in the league just because he's going to have a lot on his shoulders right off the bat. And if he succeeds with that, he's going to put up the numbers to support that. So yeah, yeah, I mean, he's the ball's in his court. You know, yeah, like we said, you it's you know we like like we said it's uh, McMahon kind of a prove it year. Um, same thing for the players on the on the court. You know they they got everything they need right now to succeed. The pieces are there. Um, so let's see if Jalen Cook can kind of step into that role and bring LSU out of the depths. We'll see. Um, moving up, I've got we just mentioned him, Walter Clayton Jr. at my number four spot. Um, I do not think. Walter Clayton Jr. is being talked enough about on a national level. Um, this was the MAC Player of the Year. I know it's the MAC, but still, Conference Player of the Year is, is is a good accomplishment. He's on an Iona team that was coached by Rick Pitino. Like like yep. you said, you can't just look at them as a MAC team. Like that's yep. a yeah. So good good team led the nation in free throw percentage, ninety four point four percent. This guy makes literally every free throw he takes. <laughs> um, and then. Listen to this. I've mentioned it before. I think you know what I'm going to say. 45%, 45 <laughs> people from three in conference play. Yeah. All right. These, the guy's a coin flip from three every time he shoots it from the point guard position. These are these are not wide open catch and shoot in the corner, spot up threes. These are usually off the dribble, off a screen and roll. Someone goes under the screen. He pops you right in the face. Walter Clayton Jr. is one of the best shooters from the point guard position in the country. And what I like, what I really like about Walter Clayton, they actually forget who posted the article, but it was an article um, about Mac coaches and their opinions on the, the outgoing transfers from the Mac. And one of the, one of the coaches uh, said about Walter Clayton Jr. is he's a football player out there. He's 6'2", 200 pounds at the point guard position. He's tough. So this isn't going to be a mid-major transfer that gets overwhelmed physically. He's got the size. He's got the strength. He's got the shooting. I don't really know what he doesn't have. What do you think, Blake? Yeah, no, I mean, I like you said, and I mentioned a minute ago, I think it's just it's understanding where he came from and, and who he was coached by. And you can say whatever you want about Rick Pitino, but um, to, to be in that position, to put up those kind of numbers, to be a conference player of the year on a Rick Patino coach team, which we know, you know, offensively the teams he's had over the years and what they are capable of, 
I mean, to me, that that tells me all I need to know. And when you watch him play, you can certainly see that. And that's why, you know, we talked about when we did our transfer rankings. I don't know. That's probably been over a month ago now. But um, how can you not look at Florida as one of the teams that just got an absolute haul because of bringing in someone like this, too? And I think what that's going to do for them offensively. And I think that was, you know, easily one of the more frustrating parts of Florida last year, right, was just looking at – different times and you're trying to figure out what can this team, like they were just really trying to pull to get points sometimes. And um, I think having a, a Walter Clayton running the show. And like I said, too, I think adding a, a Zion pull into the mix to be able to kind of compliment him as well. Um, you know, I don't know exactly what their you know, rotation looks like just yet. I'm sure we'll, we'll start to have a pretty good idea as we get closer to the season, but um, I, I would have to think this is a guy that's going to prove Florida from a shooting standpoint. And you said that just the, the shooting numbers, I think will, help them improve in a lot of shooting areas. And that's what this team needs to do to be better. So. Yeah, definitely. All right. We got three, three spots left. And I, th- I think I know who your top three is. I just don't know what order they're going to be in. Um, I want to get, give me a guess. Give me a guess. Well, but let me say this too. I don't, I'm curious because there's a guy that we have not mentioned this entire video that I and have I on my list is too. that, that I don't know if you're going to have on you. And if you don't, then I will make sure. Don't worry, fan base A. Yeah. That I will be mentioning this player in, in a little bit if, if he's not on Max's list. But I'm just gonna say that for now. I'm gonna say your top three in some order is well, Devo Davis has got to be on there. Wade Taylor's got to be on there. And then I guess it's trying to figure out if you're gonna put Zakai Ziegler on there, knowing he has an injury. But I still think overall, talent wise, he's easily in the top three for me. Um, so I think it's gonna be those three in some order. All right, I actually left Devo out of the point guard. Okay, and I understand I why. Him. Okay, so I was going to say I, that. I understand why you did that. Okay. I could group him in with with uh, Mark Sears as a you know okay. co- combo guard that's probably going to be doing a lot of the ball handling, but... Gotcha. Okay, so if if Devo and Mark were in this list, they would be in the top five, no, yeah. no doubt about it. Okay, but I left them out just because I don't think they're primary point guard. You know, I think they're more of a shooting okay. guard, combo guard. So, so yeah, yeah, Wade and Wade Taylor and Zakai Ziegler, and then so my number it's, three, it's gotta, it's be, gotta be the man. It's Ezra Mignon. Yeah, there you go. Yep, it's about time the nation starts putting some respect <laughs> on this backcourt, this Vandy backcourt. Um, the rest of the lineup, I'm not so sure about, but one thing they have down is this backcourt. Um, doesn't get much better than Ezra Mignon when you're looking for a a pure point guard who's going to control the game. He had, listen to this assist to turnover ratio in SEC play. This is an overall 4.4 assists to every turnover. That is absurd. No. That is absurd. You're For reference, normally you're looking at about like a 4.5 to 3, 4.5 to 2.5, kind of like that. This is 4.5 to 1. He Ezra does not turn the ball over. Um, only knock on him is his three-point shooting. If you've been following – uh, SEC basketball the past few years, you know Ezra. He's never been a. That's never been his game. He's never been a knockdown three point shooter. Um, he shot about 10, 20 percent uh, all four years of college. But what he doesn't make up for, what he doesn't have three point shooting, he makes up for with that like aggressiveness, the driving, the finishing ability. During the month of March, averaged 16 points a game. Uh, everybody is so high on Riley Kugel because of his 17 points a game during the month of March to finish last year, a lot of people think Kugel might take Florida to the next level. No one's talking about Ezra. 16 points yeah. a game during the month of March. That is impressive. That's when competition is at its highest, when people are battling for an SEC tournament seed. He's putting up 16 points a game. So if he had the three-point shooting, if he if he could space the floor a little bit, oh, I would love this guy. But um, I don't know how you leave Ezra. If you're talking top five point guards in the conference, I don't know how he's not in that conversation. No, he's got to be in there. That's what I said, kind of teasing that a minute ago. I was like, okay, yep. he's either he's either left off Devo Davis or Ezra Menyon. I was like, I know yeah. Max is not leaving Ezra Menyon. So I was like, all right, I just want to make sure we we added that caveat caveat in. And I'll I'll touch on Davis here to get back to him in a second. But yes, Vanderbilt is going to have one of the best backcourts in the SEC next season, and and that is why I think and and we we teased and joked earlier about you know ranking them lower and some of the reaction to that, but. You know, it's also not a, a two on two game, but um, I think they are going to have one of the best backcourts without question, the SEC. And I think it's just the emergence of what those two guys did together, Mignon Lawrence, and, and to have that duo coming back 
and just having, you know, as we're running the show here, I mean, like you said, you just look at what this guy did towards the end of last season. And, you know, we could point to a lot of different areas as to reasons why Vanderbilt made the jump they made after a slow start and put themselves in position to at least be in the NCAA tournament conversation when no one thought they had a chance to get there. Um, but they did. And, and he was one of the reasons why. And like you said, obviously you'd love to be able to, you know, have more, of an option from the outside in terms of making shots from three, but you know what, who knows? We, we've seen guys do that before in the off season where they, you know, I, I mean, there's no doubt, right? Like he understands that's an area he needs to improve in. I know the staff understands that. Uh, but at the same time, we are used to seeing, you know, kind of this, this new era of basketball where you just expect guys to go out and be able to shoot and make shots um, if you're at a guard position, but it's not always necessary. Like it, it isn't like you can still have kind of that traditional point guard like this, who plays a ton of minutes, um, you know, having the ball in his hands puts your team in a lot better position than if you don't have the ball in his hands. And we saw that. I mean, I, I think he is just one of the most improved players we saw in the league last year. And I think just the absolute awesomeness that could be this backcourt. Um, that is why Vanderbilt, I think, again, will be in a position, even if they're picked lower going into the season, um, they will once again be in a position to exceed expectations because of having an Ezra Manuel on, I think, at point guard. So. Yeah, not many teams can uh, can boast a point guard with an assist to turnover ratio like that, like just like a game controller oh, yeah. like that. Um, a lot of teams have these high scoring, you know, new new point guards, Jalen Cook, L. Ellis, but it's like, oh, I don't know how the turnovers and the inconsistent. That's, you don't well, got to worry about that. You know what? And think about how many teams in the SEC defensively, what their primary right. focus is, is forcing turnovers. Right. And, and yet he's still able to put up that kind of number in a league where – You've got, you know, the Missouris, the the Auburns, the AMs. I know I'm probably for Arkansas and teams like that who we know kind of their coaches really focus on the the forcing turnovers aspect of defense. And so yeah, I mean it's um it's a remarkable uh number for sure. Yeah. Definitely not getting enough credit on a national scale. Um so moving up to the top two. Uh Ooh, here we go. My opinion, I think these are pretty solidified top two um point guards, but I can see I can see a few other arguments for maybe two or three other guys to slip in here, but uh, number two I've got Zakai Zakai Ziegler. Um, I know he's coming off the injury. I don't. I know. I know. Um, he's he's on track to he's on track to not miss any time. Um, if he does come back and he is severely, you know, hampered, not even you know, not a fraction of himself. All right, I'm wrong. Sorry. I think he's going to come back. I think he's going to be all right. Um, all SEC second team and all SEC defensive team. Uh, only player to do that last year. Um, everyone has been talking a lot. There's been a lot of draft talk lately with uh, Case and Wallace and Anthony Black and how good they are defensively. They all at, they all averaged the same amount of steals per game. Ziegler, Case and Wallace, and Anthony Black all averaged 2.0. So um, is he undersized? Is he what is he? 5'10", 5'9", 5'11", one of those three. I've seen different ones on different sites, but he makes up for it with the steals. He's a very good defensive point guard. His three-point percentage dipped a little bit last year. It was around 35% the year before, dipped down to 30. Hopefully that bounces back up. But he led the SEC in assists per game, actually. I, I, I was taking a deeper dive into him. I did not know he had that. Um, He actually had five double-doubles last year where it was points assists. Um, so five times getting in double digits of assists in a league that's this good defensively, that's impressive. Um, I, I know everyone's going to talk about the injury, but I just think the numbers and his play on the court is too good to leave him out of a top three conversation here. He's absolutely in the top two. I'm with you. I don't think there's any, uh, I just, and here, let me say this. Okay. I, I, this is caveat. If you are putting Devo Davis in the conversation, I think he is in the same group with these two guys um, for, for different reasons. But if you're not, then I think, yes, I, I think these are the top two um, point guards. And again, we'll get to one here in a second. But I think with Ziegler, it's like, okay, you can anticipate or you can say, well, he's not going to be the same after the injury. Do we know that? Like, have we yeah. seen him play? <laughs> like, it's all it's yeah, I mean, it, look, and you can say the same thing and say, well, we don't know if he's going to be the exact same. But for now, I'm going to go off of what I've seen. And right. I've right. seen guys recover from ACLs and be the same player they were before. And so there's no reason for me to just play doctor and act like, okay, he's not going to be as good. I don't know that. So until I see that, he is one of the best point guards in the SEC. He's one of the top two. Whether you want to put him at one or two, I think 
again, or you, if you put Davis in there, you can be at three, but that that's a very, you know, established group when you turn, talk about the achievements and you mentioned him, mean, he's five, whatever going, I mean, he plays like he's six, five, you know? Right. So it's, you can say whatever you want about the size, but it's not affected him in terms of just the production. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think he is just the, I, I say, I mean, he's everything you want in a point guard. I, I don't know what else you could really say about that. I mean, I had him as my SEC defensive player of the year last year. And I know usually that award's given to guys who block shots and we know whether that's Castleton or, robbins or whoever but i just thought in terms of you know if i had to pick one guy defensively i, I was going with the guys but i understand that people do lean more on the big guys with that award but that's who i picked and um i just think you could see it every game just kind of his assignments going out and, and drawing guys who were just you know unbelievable scores and this guy was just able to play his style um just aggressive mad dog sort of you know i mean this guy that's what he is and so the heart and soul of the Tennessee team. I don't think there's any question about that. And uh, I am absolutely hoping that he comes back as the same player he was before, because I'm going to be selfish in that regard. Cause I just want to, I want to watch him play because I think he is just one of those guys that you, you love to watch play. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. There's, there's no doubt in my mind that he's one of the, the top two, three, again, if you want to go, if you want to add a, a guy in there, but um, he's absolutely in there and there's no debate for me on that. So. Yeah. And I was actually shocked when I was doing a little bit of- more research on this. I was like, Ziegler's only going into his junior year. I feel like this guy's been there forever. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh my gosh, he's young. I know. Well, that's, I mean, look, he's played in 65 games the past two seasons. Um, you know, and I think, again, you could see that in his freshman year where you could just tell, and just Rick Barnes tough. could tell, like, he's just, he's that guy. Like, he's yeah. exactly what Tennessee needed. And yeah, I mean, that's why. That's why you and I are as high as we are on Tennessee heading into the season with that trio of of Ziegler, um, Vescovy, and just high Jordan James. I mean, there's just that that's a trio that's won a lot of games together, and they all have all SEC first team potential. So yeah. All right. Quick before we cover our number one point guard, I want a quick reaction. Who do you think, if it is not Wade Taylor and it is not Zakai Ziegler, who do you think could have a chance at dethroning these top two here okay so if again if we go on the basis that we're going to leave davis out of the conversation yes. because i and i look arkansas we have a lot of arkansas fans everyone knows this but um if if i had to rank him like he is in the top three for me and i there's it's a non-debate on that if we put him in the conversation but as max said earlier he talked about kind of the criteria and all that so you can say it and we don't want to you know again for arkansas fans you've watched the channel for for years now, you know that um, we're, we're not saying this to leave him out. We're, we're giving you different criteria to work with. But, and the same with Mark Sears too, by the way. Right. Um, like we said, it's kind of a, it's a combination thing on those teams. And we'll talk more about those guys probably as we do in another video and start yes. ranking kind of other guard positions. So keep that in mind. We are, we're going to keep going here. And so we'll talk about. Wait, we haven't the, forgotten about those guys. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about the off the, you know, the, the combo guards and those kind of things. But if it's not one of those two. I mean, I, I think the easy answer for me is it's, it's Ezra Mignon. I mean, I think it's, it's go. probably him. Um, because like I said, I think if, if Vanderbilt is, is again, going to be a team that, that overachieves, um, and, and that's subjective, <laughs> maybe you think they should be ranked the top 25 to enter the year and that's fine. But, um, if they're going to be, then to me, it's, it's either him or Tyron Lawrence. Actually, I don't say, it's the combination of the two. I don't think just one's going to be able to do it. Like, I think it's going to be the combination of the two. So if we, let's say if we read it, our rankings, April the 15th, um, right. if there's a, if there's another guy I could see at number one, it's probably Ezra Manning. or, you know what, maybe it is one of these guys for transfer wise. Maybe it's a Kentucky freshman. I, who knows? Right. Like I think yeah, those who knows are also, these freshmen. yeah, I mean the freshmen, the, those are the ones that are just hard to rank going into the season because uh, you can look at it. I mean, I don't know if Brandon Miller is a good example, but like we knew Brandon Miller was going to be good last year, but like, do we think he was going to be just that, you know, right. ridiculous? Like we thought he'd be really good, but it's like, you just, I think it's hard to rank those guys. So um, yeah, I would say Manion would be my choice. Yeah. I was going to go. I was so glad you said that. Cause I was going to say the same thing. If we see a little bit of like a day one Harris at Kansas situation where slowly creeps up with the three-point shooting just a little bit. Like, if he can take his three-point shot just to 30, 
just a 30%, yeah. you know, maybe make one three a game type of thing just to kind of stretch the defense a little bit. Watch out. No, yeah. Um, But yeah, let's get, let's just cover uh, the main man here. Surprised at his play last year. I knew Wade Taylor was going to be a piece here for Buzz Williams, but what a year. All, all SEC first team, one of three returners coming back from that first team. Uh, Vescovy's coming back for Tennessee and uh, Tolu Smith for Mississippi State. And then Wade Taylor is the third first team returner. He had uh, the most free throws made in SEC play despite being fourth in free throw attempts. <laughs> so 92 free throws or 94 free throws made on 92%. Pretty much every time he gets to the line, he's cashing. Um, and I mean, you look at some of the games that Texas A&M won. I think it was uh, the home game against uh, Alabama. Sorry, Crimson Tide fans, but Texas A&M uh, won that game because Wade Taylor scored 28 points and went 10 of 10 from the free throw line. You know, that's the type of thing he can do. Um, increased his three point percentage from his freshman year by 10 percent. Was at a 25 percent, jumped up to 35, which is right where you need a point guard. Um just, I don't know how you put a better scoring point guard above Wade Taylor. I mean, he just completely controls games. Seems like no one can stay in front of him. Um, I know you love Wade Taylor. I want to hear what you got to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, we're doing this on the basis of just true point guards, true guys. Point who guard. Not necessarily in that combo guard range. We're talking just true point guards. He is the best true point guard yes. in the SEC. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have any argument there because he was the breakout star, you know, last season. And I think from, you talk about, it's, it's easy to forget how young, like this guy's just going to be a junior. Yeah. And, both, both him like, and Ziegler. It's like, how are they this young? I know. Like, it's wild to think, but like Wade Taylor is going to be a junior. So I think when you think about that and just kind of the sophomore season that he had, um, yeah, I mean, look, A&M, as we said, Wade Taylor was the breakout kind of player last season of the league texas a&m was the breakout team in terms of going 15 and 3 in the conference um and so yeah i mean he he was the reason for that not to take anything away from anyone else on that that group tyree stradford dexter dennis marble coleman and so forth way taylor was the driver of what texas a&m did last season and you know it's because he plays the point guard but i mean that was a huge jump in terms of, I think, just what they put together offensively. And, and that's something else to think about. They've improved every year offensively under Buzz Williams. Uh, the past four years, if you look at kind of their efficiency numbers and such, they've improved every single season. And now, can they take that next step? I mean, to improve, I, I think they absolutely can, having a Wade Taylor, um, you know, to be able to do that. So, yeah, I mean, just, um, you know, again, I, I didn't think Texas A&M was getting enough love. I think people thought it was just sort of a, a random thing last year. And, Look, I know they, you know, lost the NCAA tournament game and whatever, but um, at a certain point, when you play thirty whatever games, it's not just you know a random lucky thing. It's it's purely based around how much better a team has gotten and just the overall development. Because remember where they were early last season, right? They're getting blown out by Colorado. They're losing at home to, or they're losing. Yeah, they lost at home to Wofford. Some lost to Murray State. Games, yeah, yeah. I mean, but but Way Taylor's emergence is the reason they they got where they are and. That is the reason why you and I are probably as high as we are on Texas A&M again coming into the season is because they have, you know, the the best I think true point guard, most well rounded point guard I think in the in the SEC. Yeah, and with how good the SEC is going to be defensively next year, I mean, it was a great defensive league last year, but yeah, a little bit because of how poor the shooting was, maybe a little bit of both. But this league is going to have multiple top twenty five defenses. And it just helps to go on the road and know you have a true point guard. You know, yeah. it, it with these teams like Alabama and Arkansas, I know we keep coming back to them, and that's because they don't really have that true defined returning point guard. Um, yeah. When, when say, an Arkansas or an Alabama goes on the road to play at Tennessee, you know, it's like, oh, geez, you know, how are the turnovers going to be? How's the Is the offense going to be able to get into a flow? You don't really have to worry about that when you have a guy like Wade Taylor. It's like, Never. All right, the great defense, but we got our guy, you know, yeah. um, and that just helps. I know they took the the hard loss in March, but I think any team in the country would have lost to that Penn State team with how they were shooting the ball oh, that yeah. night. So I don't – I think that's more – I think that game is more of a tip your cap to Penn State's shooting than 
then, you know, knock Buzz Williams and Texas A&M off their pedestal that they just had a great season. So I like, I like Texas A&M going into next year. And a big reason why is because they got their main man back. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm, I'm really high on them and, you know, we'll see kind of where they wind up um, in our official preseason rankings. We do closer to the season, but I think for now, yeah, I mean, they're, they're high up there as we talked about in the other group. All right. So, there are rankings or just kind of, I guess it kind of, you know, evolved from just rankings and just basically talking about every point guard, kind of option point guard that, overview <laughs> that could be out there in the sec this season. Uh, and, and you know, what happens is always, there's going to be someone's name. We did not mention that. Although I think we did a pretty good job pretty much getting everyone. I think but, Justin Hill didn't get a mention from Georgia. Justin Hill. All right. Justin well, Hill is, uh, the, returning there for, for the bulldogs, but they got, uh, Tomasin, Tomason, whatever his last name you know, is coming back. We've, we've tried to hit on as many point guards as we can. So it's kind of more just a general overview of the point That's guards for the SEC yeah. uh, heading into it. We will, I'm sure, title it ranking because it's YouTube and, well, you know, ranking does better. But, um, yeah, I mean, like we said, if you're looking for – and you, and I know, again, I think Davis and Sears are the two specifically. We will talk about them in the next video we do as we kind of look at more of the, the combo – guards who you know are more than just the true point guard kind of spots and and guys we expect to be kind of in those true point guard spots heading into the season as we know though um you talked about kind of the positionless basketball um committee all like there's just that's what basketball is these days so it's much harder to gauge exactly what guys are going to be but have no fear arkansas alabama fans and many other fan bases uh, we will be bringing up uh, your favorite guard uh coming up probably in the next video too because we'll look at more of the the combo guards. And then, as we said earlier, we'll continue to look through uh, a lot of other uh, kind of spots, you know, looking at the, the forwards and centers, those kind of things as well. But as always, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you can catch everything we do here, SEC basketball wise in the off season. And, uh, you know, check out everything we're doing SEC football. I see football media days coming up next week. If you're watching this in mid July, um, we will have coverage of that. We're doing all of our football team previews. Uh, they're all up. Chris did some stuff on the MLB draft, looking at where SEC players are, we're drafted, so a lot of good stuff if you're an SEC fan. So check everything out. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button as well. That helps us out. And uh, for Max Barr, who always does a great job here with our SEC basketball offseason coverage, um, we will talk to you again here soon at Southeastern 14.